Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, soaring gas prices, panic buying of petrol and dwindling supplies of labour and food has led Prime Minister Boris Johnson's critics to ask if the UK is heading into a winter of discontent. Our business correspondent Simon Pusey will be joining me in the studio for an update on what feels like a never-ending period of uncertainty for British consumers. And as Nigeria celebrates 61 years of independence, Dr. Neka Abulokwe, OBE, the founder and CEO of Micromax Consulting, will be joining me in the studio to discuss the economic contribution of the diaspora and potential ways forward. Then later, the chief marketing analyst at Exinity, Han Tan, will be joining me from Abu Dhabi for the latest market reaction in the Asia-Pacific region about the crippling agonies of Evergrande. But first, as always, let's start the show with business news from here in the UK. This week, the opposition Labour Party held their annual conference under the microscope of naysayers who have accused the party's leader, Sir Keir Starmer, of failing to convincingly hold the government to account over its poor handling of the pandemic. He's outspoken Deputy Angela Rayner ruffled feathers after she described the Conservatives as scum and failed to apologise. There are concerns that her comments will further isolate the centre-left support. The Starmer is desperate to lure back. During a half-hour address, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves announced plans to scrap hundreds of tax breaks and set up an office of value for money, which aides describe as a hit squad to scrutinise government spending and ensure tax is used wisely. In other British business news, medical workers and transport companies have warned of risk of major disruption after days of hysteric panic buying has led to the country's 8,000 petrol stations almost totally drained of fuel. The government is coming under increasing pressure to get a grip on the crisis, which initially began with small-scale disruptions. Alongside surging energy prices, wide-scale labour shortages and dwindling consumer confidence, critics have asked if the UK is heading into a winter of discontent reminiscent of the crippling union strikes that occurred during the late 70s. Let's ask our business correspondent Simon Pusey who joins me in the studio now. Simon, there are so many issues that the Prime Minister has to deal with but of course the fuel crisis tops that list. Yeah, certainly in the immediate few days, um, hopefully not but weeks, um, this crisis seems to have come um, from nowhere really, but I think it has actually been bubbling around for a while. Um, the uh, the shadow cabinet say that they wrote to the transport minister months ago saying that there was a potential for um, shortages in things like f food and fuel because of the number of lorry drivers that have gone down since Brexit and because of Covid, that there could be a perfect storm come the winter when um, people need to buy these items um, and we've seen in the past how panic buying can just spring up because of a few rumours put on social media and then everyone sees that someone's doing something and so they take suit. The um, RAC, um, the, the breakdown company, say they saw um, two weeks worth of breakdowns in just one day, people calling saying, you know, we've run out of fuel. And those kind of stories and anecdotes will obviously feed into other people's fears who then go out and exacerbate the problem. Um, the uh, Petrol Retailers Association said as many as two thirds of its members were now out of fuel, with the rest of them partly dry or running out soon. It must be said this isn't affecting the whole of the UK. It's mainly urban areas like London and the big cities. Uh, Northern Ireland, for example, is totally unaffected. So it's one of those things that we will see a lot of because we're in London, but maybe in the rural, more rural areas. Areas, um, things things are fine, and um, the PRA, cha PRA chairman laid the blame on panic buying, pure and simple. The things that we should probably be worried about is things like, you know, key workers, the NHS, uh, police, and um, uh, you know, fire fire service staff just getting into work. Um, actually, ambulances themselves have their own stocks of petrol at the at the hospitals, so that's not too um, big of an issue. So, what is happening? What the government have preparing the army, which is um, what always happens in these crises. They're not often used, but it sounds big and tough to say we're getting the army sort of prepared. In reality, there's not actually much they can do because training an HGV driver does take months of practice and work. And while I'm sure the army are great at lots of things, this is quite a specialist job. But um, the Ministry of Defense saying they're putting about 150 qualified drivers
drivers on short notice in addition to another 150 personnel. Um, but military drivers will still need to be trained. The government um, say that they are also introducing temporary visas for 5,000 fuel tanker staff um, at short notice. So they're hoping to get basically people from Europe back <laughs> for Christmas. Um, and a lot of people who, um, you know, against Brexit are obviously pointing the finger at Brexit. I think it's a, a mix of things, including COVID, because I think a number of companies have still um, got people on furlough, which obviously aren't helping. Um, and there's some other issues as well. But I think it's um, going to be yeah, a worrying few days. But usually these things plateau after a few days um, when people see that there is enough fuel. And it, it must be said there is enough fuel. It's just a shortage of drivers to get it to the, the petrol station. So I think it's um, it's worrying in the short term. And we've seen some you know huge queues of hundreds of meters and even some fights breaking out where people are obviously stressed and panicking and wanting to get their fuel. But I think, you know, in the next few days, we should see a return to normality. Well, we'll see what the uh, next issue is next week. Thank you, Simon. Today, Nigerians at home and abroad are celebrating 61 years of independence. Since last year's milestone, budding entrepreneurs in the tech sector have been the face of lucrative mergers. Our health practitioners have been on the front line in the battle against the pandemic. And a flurry of high-profile names have secured and retained positions in the highest seat of power. The diaspora contribution to this success is no longer a throwaway sentiment. And one of our most successful contributors to the business world joins me now in the studio. Dr. Neka Abulokwe, OBE, is the founder and CEO of Micromax Consulting, and she serves on several boards as a non-executive director. Highly regarded in the field of tech enablement and governance, Dr. Necker has been ranked number four in the Inclusive Forbes and Financial Times' top 100 black, Asian, minority, ethnic tech leaders for 2018. She was also named in the 2019 Power List 100 Most Influential Black Business Leaders. And she's a freeman of both the City of London and the Technologist Livery Company, amongst so many other things. Dr. Necker, thank you so much for joining me in the studio. It's such a delight to have you here. When you look back over the past 12 months and even further, what kind of events or um, you know things just uh, pop up when you think of the contribution from the Nigerian diaspora? Juliana, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such a pleasure. And the Nigerians in diaspora have done so well, not just in the last 12 months, but progressively. You know, I came to this country in 1991 and I've seen the advancement and how Nigerians have contributed to not just the UK, we're in the UK here today, but also to America and just across Europe and across the world. I mean, in um, recent months, we had Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, you know, um, heading up the WTO, power to her. We're really, really proud of her. Even in terms of other sectors, the banking sector, you know, the African Development Bank, you know, we have Akimumi um, Madishino, and we have others, you know, we have um, Amina um, um, Mohammed as well. And in the UK, I mean, those are the ones that you see in the high profile, but there are others like myself, and I am not alone. You know, this is not just a lone story. Nigerians have been making waves, and because, I mean, we are probably the first generation diaspora who have come out here, but also, I mean, we have been conditioned by Nigeria. So Nigeria has a lot and a really great and indelible footprint in our success, you know, our country today. Um, speak to most of us. We are incredibly proud of the heritage because we do have um, family and friends and we have loved ones back in Nigeria. We do have a love for our great nation. Things haven't gone to plan and as well as we would hope, you know. And I'm hoping that Nigeria does see us as a strategic influence and benefit to the country and begin to reach out to us and create an environment in which we can make an impact. I bet you, you speak to everyone. I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, my, my siblings who are also part of the diaspora, but also seasoned professionals, as you have just mentioned, a few who are making waves and, you know, cre and, and, and um, elevating the profile of Nigeria. Now we want Nigeria to do something for us so we can do more for our countries. We're giving our best years to other countries. Absolutely. Indeed. You talk about elevating profiles. You've certainly been elevated and you've received the highest recognition that this country can offer Indeed. by way of an OBE from the Queen, Indeed. Her Majesty um, herself. She could be watching. Um, how much of that success can you attribute to growing up in Nigeria? 
Yes, um, I did grow up in Nigeria. I was born in the UK and then grew up in Nigeria. So my formative years were spent in Nigeria. My primary school, I went to Port Harcourt Primary School. I went to Federal Government Girls College, Aboloma, and then I went to University of Port Harcourt. I left University of Port Harcourt in search of um, opportunities and pastures green. Came to the UK, and I've been in the UK for 30 years now, actually, 30 years. And that has been, um, has been hugely successful because I must say the UK has created an environment in which we can succeed. Now Nigeria has had an underpinning you know, I will say that, I mean, under, Nigeria has underpinned my success because um, we had really good education, solid education. There's always this thing about parents, I mean, putting emphasis on education and the quality of education. I benefited from that. You know, my teachers, I'm still in touch with a lot of my teachers because my teachers have been a contributing factor to my success. I came out here to the UK with a fearless spirit, you know, fearless to go forth and conquer, go forth and make a mark. And that has held me in good stead throughout my career. So from um, starting off as an analyst, you know, to middle management, to senior management, and then to executive management. And then also, that has, um, I'll, I'll tell you another important ingredient has been I've always studied alongside my professional. So I've done my, my professional career, I've done professional development, but I've also done academia in terms of up to the doctoral level. And that has positioned me or put me in a really good position to go out there to be recognized for which I'm incredibly grateful. Um, you just said uh, one of the highest honors of the land, you know, for services to business. And, um, and that in itself has changed and transformed my life because I've been called to serve. And not just to serve in the UK, because the OBE, the, the, the order of the most excellent, um, well, the, um, the most excellent order of, of the knighthood, is across the Commonwealth, you know. So that in itself has, has called me to serve. Nigeria is a part of the Commonwealth. So the order of the British Empire is very important to Nigeria. I'm not alone. There are several of us, seasoned, highly qualified professionals who want to make a contribution and a mark in Nigeria. Absolutely, uh, so well deserved and uh, Thank you. thoroughly inspiring. Thank um, you. You've spoken in the past about reconciliation you know trying to usher in a season of reconciliation between Nigeria and the diaspora can you expand on this what does this mean it means a lot I mean it means a lot and for me as a as a business professional you know punching at the, the most senior levels of, of society it is strategic for Nigeria in terms of diaspora okay um, I was reading I mean I've read so many reports you know these these, these things are reported and it's in the public domain in terms of the um, diaspora and how much we even remit to Nigeria 25 billion dollars 25 billion dollars you know and this I mean 70 percent of that or it's estimated that about 70 percent of that is spent on consumer so this is for basic necessities for basic needs you know and 30 percent into investment now you can imagine if that was changed and we had 70% or Nigeria created an environment in which we could invest 70% um, into investments in Nigeria. You know, there's a dearth of, of infrastructure, social housing, you know, all those sorts of things. Now, if you look at the, the proportion or the population of the, the diaspora, um, the Nigerian diaspora, it's estimated at about um, 15 million, 15 million. And these are highly skilled, skilled, and semi-skilled professionals. Look at that proportion of that brain drain from Nigeria. If Nigeria was to create even a portal where we could credibly um, and, and advertise credible opportunities for us to invest, because now look at the Naira. The Naira has been devalued so much. You know, we have to have that security to know that we can, we can gain our return on investment, our earnings, our wages, the things that we, we invest in Nigeria. Nigeria has to be more competitive for us. You know, and also creating an environment in which we can say, yes, we are there, we're proud to go back. I mean, I can't beat this drum enough. I've spoken about it before. I'm a massive advocate for that change, that transformational change, but it has to be um, attractive for us. You know, it is business. I mean, we don't have, and not everybody is fortunate to have the connections or the deep pockets. Mm. But what, what, what we can do is we, they can meet us halfway and then begin to sh showcase credible opportunities, you know, that can help to 
uh, um, to rise the tide or raise the tide for all, for everybody. Dr. Neka Abulokwe, OBE, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. I know our viewers would have learned so much from your valuable insights. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up on Channels Business Global, the Chief Marketing Analyst at Xenity, Han Tan, will be joining me from Abu Dhabi for the latest market reaction in the Asia-Pacific region about the crippling agonies of Evergrande. And Tosin Faniro Dada, the Managing Director and CEO of Endeavor Nigeria, will be joining me from Lagos for some insights into the group's upcoming Catalyzing Conversations Summit. See you after the break. Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. In a few minutes, I'll be speaking with Han Tan from Exinity and Tosin Faniril Dada of Endeavour. But before then, here's some global business news for you. After a fragmented vote, the shape of Germany's next government will depend on fraught and perhaps lengthy coalition negotiations. The centre-left Social Democrats narrowly beat outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel's centre-right bloc in a tight ballot, but the party fell short of achieving a majority to govern alone. Local media reports suggest fractures and recriminations have already emerged. Angela Merkel will stay on as the country's caretaker leader until a new government is formed. Accountancy firm Grant Fortin has been fined £2.3 million for failures in its audits of collapsed cake chain Patisserie Valerie. The Financial Reporting Council ruled that management failed to notice red flags and showed a serious lack of competence between 2015 and 2017. Patisserie Valerie collapsed the following year, resulting in the loss of 900 jobs and a police investigation into fraud allegations. Shares in Cineworld have soared this week ahead of the delayed release of the 25th Bond film, No Time to Die. More than 175,000 tickets have been sold for the film in the past two weeks. And overall, cinema attendance this month is expected to be a tenth higher than in September 2019, before Covid struck. The Bond blockbuster was due to be released in April last year, but has been delayed several times as the pandemic pushed cinemas to the brink of collapse. Now to our next story. The debt crisis haunting property giant Evergrande poses a significant challenge, not only for the Chinese government, but for the entire global economy, in as debts of more than 400 billion US dollars, and last week convinced creditors it would pay them the 110 million they were owed after missing several key deadlines. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by the chief marketing analyst at Exinity, Han Tan, who joins me from Abu Dhabi. Han Tan, it's always a pleasure to have you on Channels Business Global. Welcome back. It's been a while. Please shed some light on how the Asia-Pacific markets have been reacting to this kind of crippling turmoil that Evergrande have found themselves in. Do you think investors have already priced in more losses? Um, I think investors have priced in what they know at uh, on hand right now, right? I mean, granted, there was the risk of sentiment when uh, those headlines started grabbing more real estate uh, on uh, online terminals and on newspapers. But I think uh, that has found a floor for the time being, because if you look at, say, the Hang Seng Properties Index, for example, it is trying to stage a recovery. It has been trying to do so in recent sessions. So I think overall, while that uncertainty still remains, uh, markets are getting acclimatized to uh, the idea that ultimately what policymakers will try to do is try to perhaps engineer a uh, soft landing or a cushion fallout, uh, you know, given that the risks otherwise may be too great to bear at this point in time. Absolutely. Can we uh, step back a little bit and just kind of look at um, what um, the Evergrande crisis has revealed? Because it's kind of, you know, chipping away at China's rather opaque financial system. Is this the first time that we are noticing that, you know, this growth, growth, growth strategy um, may be doing some damage underneath the surface? Yeah. Uh, so the short and perhaps oversimplified answer to that is uh, no, this is not the first time. I mean, keep in mind for uh, Evergrande themselves, uh, they have had uh, similar episodes where its saga had bubbled to the surface even from last year, right? And uh, we have seen uh, other uh, perhaps precedents, for lack of a better word, um, you know, with other distressed companies that required policymaker intervention in, uh, in recent years as well, right? So uh, I think what 
policymakers ha have shown is that, you know, again, this overall mantra of that greater good, right? They have, um, you know, goals such as common prosperity, right? So those are perhaps some of the overarching goals that policymakers want to keep front and center. And granted, while some of these dr dramatic episodes may be detract uh, detracting from those goals, I think policymakers want to you know, make sure that those broader agendas are achieved. Uh, you know, whether it comes at the expense of some of these individual companies, uh, we really have to wait and see. But based on historical precedents, uh, not so much. Absolutely. We'll just have to see how this pans out. Always great to speak to you, Han, Chief Market Analyst at Xenity. Thanks so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Thank you. My pleasure. Endeavor Nigeria, the leading community of high-impact entrepreneurs, has announced that its third annual Scale-Up Entrepreneurship Summit, Catalyzing Conversations, will be held on Thursday, the 21st of October. The conversations will focus on innovation, high-growth company dynamics and high-impact entrepreneurship. The CEO and Managing Director of Endeavor, Tosin Fanarodada, joins me now from Lagos. Tosin Fanny Rodada, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Thanks for fitting me in as any high-flying entrepreneur. I know you've got a very busy schedule, especially because over the next couple of days, you're going to be having this amazing summit. Can you shed some light around this year's theme, the multiplier effect? What exactly does that mean? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Juliana. Thank you for having me. So um, our mission at Endeavor is to unlock the transformational power of entrepreneurship. And how do we do this? We do this by selecting, supporting, and investing in the world's top founders. Now, this year's Catalyzing Conversation theme, The Multiplier Effect, would truly convey that high-impact entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs leading high-growth companies truly transform economies by creating large-scale jobs and wealth, by enabling sectors and companies, and by reinvesting their time and wealth in the next generation of entrepreneurs. And to your question, our virtual summit will bring together entrepreneurs from four continents who are building transformational companies in industries such as fintech, mobility, consumer technology, in emerging markets like Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, and of course, Nigeria. Absolutely. Over the past couple of years, I've dipped in and out of your summit. It's always very, very glossy, amazing and really, really impactful. So I'm expecting uh, the same this year. But of course, um, Tosin, we know that the pandemic has changed so many things. We are celebrating 61 years of Nigeria's independence today. So we're all in a great mood, but also a reflective mm -hmm. mood. And how has the pandemic uh, changed the way you kind of arranged this year's lineup? Um, I think the pandemic has opened everyone's eyes to what is possible virtually, what is possible digitally. I think technology has been the only viable solution to overcoming the constraints caused by the pandemic. Last year's catalyzing conversation was virtual, as you can imagine. And even though we've seen some physical activity or physical events this year, we've even seen some hybrid models, for example, we decided to keep CC virtual to ensure that we have rich conversations from entrepreneurs around the globe. And as you know, Juliana, um, countries have different, have varying quarantining requirements, varying vaccine requirements. And right now it's just really difficult for some people to travel. And so because we're so focused on having an impactful event and having exciting, rich conversations, we decided to keep it virtual so that we can have entrepreneurs from all over the globe um, speaking at this conference. Absolutely. So at least I don't get to uh, miss any of um, the impactful event. Tell us, um, Tosin, what are the kind of standout moments um, or standout speakers, apart from yourself, of course, that we should uh, look out for? <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm super excited for this year's, for this year's event. Um, Endeavor is a leading global community of, by, and for high, impact, for high impact entrepreneurs. And we've been around for 24 years. We're in 40 markets. And this makes it really easy for us to convene the top founders in emerging markets. And this year's event, um, we will have four fireside chats and three textile talks. Um, one of the fireside chats that I'm absolutely excited for is the one on a journey from startup to unicorn. And so we're gonna have two unicorn companies, one from Africa, one from Latin America, talking to us about their journey 
from startup to, to unicorn, we're also going to have exciting conversations on topics like creating value in logistics and supply chain ecosystem. We're going to have an exciting conversation on financial freedom for emerging and frontier markets. We're going to have exciting TED style talks from entrepreneurs um, like Bamboo, for instance, like like um, Helium Health, for instance, and also like Bankly. So I'm super excited about what we have packed. Well, Catalyzing Conversations 2021 is certainly in my diary. Tosin Faniro Dada, CEO of Endeavor Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.